Okay, um, now let's fumble through this. Um, currently sort of working on my resume, so I had some free time on my hands, and um, there's a couple of JVM, or a couple of procedural languages available for, for Postgres that are written in Java. One of them is called PL Java. Um, then there is another one that was written about 14 years ago called PLJ. The difference between the two of them is PL Java runs in process. So I don't know whether you're familiar with Postgres and how it runs, but each connection is its own process. So if you have 100 connections, you have 100 processes. And if you have PLJ running, or PL Java, sorry, running, you have 100 Java JVMs running with, uh, you know, 100 connections. And 100 connections is pretty small, actually, by most Postgres standards. So about 14 years ago, I was involved with a guy named Laszlo, and we wrote PLJ, and it kind of competed with PL Java, but neither of us were really committed, so PLJ kind of lost the uh, lost the discussion with PL Java. Um, but two years ago, I was working with Pivotal, and we wrote something called PL Container. PL Container sort of does uh, solves a problem with Post Postgres's procedural languages in that. Um, there's a notion in Postgres of a trusted language or an untrusted language. Untrusted languages require you to be a super user in order to create functions in them. Trusted languages allow you to anybody to create them as long as they have the ability to create a, create a function. Um, the other difference is that a trusted function is sort of guaranteed not to be messing with the database in ways that you know could destroy it, such as reading the file system. So you can imagine PL Python or something like that that has uh, that is untrusted. Once it gets um, control, it could go in and you know delete files, do whatever it wants. So um, PL Container tries to solve that problem by uh, running uh, Python in a container, in a Docker container. So there's a whole bunch of code that was written uh, that allowed the uh, remote procedural calls from Postgres into a Docker container and in and out, back and forth, right? So um, that's where this all sort of came from. And then, um, so I ended up, I, I ended up, decided I could rewrite PLJ using all of the PL container uh, machinery that was done and then have it run in, in the JVM. As I said, uh, why? Most, mostly because I had free time, had nothing better to do. And I'd always wanted to make it work. And Netty makes it a whole lot easier to do this whole problem. Uh, the code is actually quite small in Netty. And after you figure out Netty, of course. So a little bit of how it actually works. Um, you create a language called PJ. PL, how, how many people are familiar with Postgres and at all? And creating languages, creating extensions, how any of that stuff works? It's all magic. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, okay, so languages in, in Postgres are nothing more than a uh, a call handler written in C. The call handler uh, gets the context. It has all the information about the return type. It has information about the arguments. It has the arguments, and it has the function definition. So you have all the information you really need to create a remote procedural call. So um, once you get control in the function handler, you in PLJ, I create a call request object with all the objects, or all the arguments, sorry. I send the call request uh, to, the Java, to, to the JVM process that's running on, inside the JVM. It uses a binary protocol, uh, which actually mimics Postgres's binary protocol. Um, there's some good reasons for doing that, which, which involves being able to deal with arrays of objects in, in Postgres, which is a little bit out of the scope of this. Um, at any rate, it, it uses this binary protocol. So once we get into the Java side, we just uh, decode the request, which is basically the arguments, the types, everything else. 
instantiate the function, call the method, and return, uh, and return the response back. So currently, the code can deal with any of the base types and arrays of base types. Um, I'm working on how to deal with user-defined types. As I said, that's a little bit more difficult because we can have arrays of user-defined types. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this talk in this group was I have some questions on how to deal with certain things, such as how to map this user-defined type in Postgres to a type in Java, because I can't actually send the package information. There's no way to actually get that information over there. Um, So I can actually show you it actually working, I think. There we go. So let me just see if I can show you the function it's going to call. At some point I put the Java stuff up here. So this is just a bit, oh, you can't really see that, can you? Can you see it? Okay. Everybody read that? Okay. So this is a method that's going to run in the JVM. Um, all it does is log something back to the back to the user, um, and you can actually see it running. Runs pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that, for the test cases. Uh, can add, you know, it, it deals with uh, Postgres has the ability to overload functions. So there's a bunch of functions called So here's all the functions that are defined in, in there. So you can actually see that there's one, two, three, four, five, five functions called pljvm underscore add. They have different types that, they're, that are passed in. So Postgres actually deals with all of that stuff for you. And then on the corresponding side in Java, we just write a whole bunch of functions that one takes an integer, takes shorts, et cetera. Um, so back to my notes. Any questions on that? How it works? No? Are those the types are the wrapper types? Is that because Postgres is passing <laughs> null for those values? Like if add took a native primitive integer and a primitive short or whatever. So the question is, uh, how come I'm using wrapper types as opposed to uh, the, the base types? And that's actually a good question. I'm actually trying to figure out how to auto box mm -hmm. in the method. But more, the other part of the question was because we can, with, with the wrapper type, we can actually send nulls. So um, I can create a null inside the, act, inside the decoding of the, of the message. So, Maybe I don't actually want to send base types at all because then I can't then I can't change you know pass nulls. Um, so I'm actually kind of looking for feedback. So if you guys have any ideas here of how to make this better, what what you could actually use it for, how to change it in such a way, it's actually pretty simple at the moment. It's really just a library. It's about, it's probably only less than a thousand lines of code in the Java stuff. The C code's pretty, pretty big at the moment, but. Um, so the kind of problems it does solve, you can get synchronous notification of data changes. Yes? Yeah, um, they, okay, so I uh, apologize for that. A function is a Postgres name and a method is a Java name, but they are the same thing. Although, yeah, so Postgres has functions or it doesn't, have, it doesn't really have a, a procedure, it, it has functions. And <coughs> methods are the same thing, so. Um, 
So you can get you can do synchronous notification of data changes. Um, it can be used with any. I'm going to skip over the second thing until we talk this a little bit more. Um, it can be used with any JVM based language. There's like a hundred of them now. There's no reason why you couldn't use this with Scala, <coughs> Kotlin, uh, you know, any JVM based language. JVM refers to the Java Virtual Machine. No problem. <laughs> On a trigger function. Yep. So the um, so the performance right now is it looks like there's about the overhead is about one millisecond on my machine. Um, and that's running the JVM on the same machine as Postgres. Um, that's actually another advantage of this versus uh, PL Java. PL Java has to run on the same machine as Postgres, whereas PL JVM could run on a separate host. So, sorry. You'd be adding the network latency in that case, though, which, depending on how, what you're doing with it, might be a better idea. Um, compared to a couple hundred. JVMs running on your Postgres machine? Fair I'm not. Enough. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, personally, I don't think I do either. But that's another story. <laughs> um, well, any any decent sized Postgres uh, production machine is going to run around 100 processes. Oh, I know. So that's and, what I'm saying. I don't think I would do either. <laughs> like, I, I wouldn't go over the network or run. Like, to me, the alternative would be to use one of the, the existing languages that Postgres supports. You know. What I mean? Okay. So you also don't always have a choice in your running or something like that. Yeah. Which is where most of the database is getting there. Sorry, you had a comment? All the languages, all the languages pretty much at least those that run in process will fire up like an interpreter for process. Some of them some of them cache the functions though. Um but, Right. Um, what, I, what we didn't find when we did the PL container stuff was once the function once a function gets to the complexity where it's over about two milliseconds, this becomes uh, that's that's kind of where you gain an advantage. And if you're if you're trying to do anything complicated in the function as opposed to just adding two integers, which is obviously trivial. Um, again, not a big deal, right? Uh, sure. Although I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what you could, what you could do in that, uh, I think there's a number of different ways of putting stuff into a rabbit. Right. Yeah, yeah. You can do that kind of stuff. I mean, so. Yeah. So the sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was about to ask another question. Yeah. No, go ahead. I'm 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 all about answering questions okay, here. So I want to hear all. I want to hear all the questions. Asynchronous notification. You also support asynchronous notification. So the question is, can you support asynchronous notification? Obviously, uh, you could. Asynchronously, you could push something from Java into some other kind of message queue and do asynchronous notification. But is, is it built in or basically? With Postgres? Well, or with like, is there a reason why you mentioned just synchronous specifically as opposed to just any kind of notification? Well, asynchronous. It's important in terms of the transaction. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. So, like, the use case would be like, I just want to filter. So as, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Dennis. Dennis mentioned it's important for transactional semantics to be synchronous. <laughs> so what, if the if the function were to fail, then the transaction would fail, and then you roll back and then retry it. So synchronous is the only reason I mentioned synchronous is because there's not a good way to get data into your program. <laughs>
There's not, a, there's not a good way to get data into your Java program unless you're going to pull it, pull the database, right? So did, you know, keep on doing selects on a table to see if something changed or to create a, uh, some kind of cube table or something like that inside Postgres to find out if something has happened in your database. There is actually, but it's called logical decoding, which I also wrote a, something about. That's exactly what this does. <laughs> this no, no, this, this does RPC. It, sh it shares one process. Yeah. So. so there's another way to do it called logical decoding. It's out of scope of this discussion. I just thought I'd throw it in there because I also, I mean, it's um, logic. I don't know whether you're, anybody's aware of how logical decoding works in Postgres, but you can actually get the write ahead logs from Postgres into your Java program in non-binary format. So. Is that how that uh, Digivium project works? So I've never heard of it. It's, uh, it publishes the change log for several databases, including Postgres. To yeah, yeah, probably. To a message queue. Yeah, probably based on this. There's a project called Divisium that does that. Uh, it, it, it's a Java project that reads the, the <coughs> transaction log and <coughs> publishes messages to a message queue for. So uh, you have to have actual access on the machine to do that? You need a log? No, you don't. No. Okay, so what, if, it, if it's actually reading the, the, the write ahead log, then no. This actually pushes. Yeah, it probably uses this for Postgres. When, is the, when did that project merge, you know? No, then it wasn't. <laughs> for sure, it doesn't do logical okay. decoding. No. Okay. Yeah. no, this is actually super cool. It's super great. awesome. So anyway, so a uh, couple things I needed to figure out, I still haven't figured out, is one, how to do class path separation. Obviously, if we're doing RPCs, we don't want to have one uh, connection reading the data from another connection. Uh, basically, I think sort of copying Jetty's class path separation basically works. Um, obviously, the one I mentioned earlier was how to, how to get user-defined types mapped to, to Java types. Uh, if anybody's got any great ideas for that, I'm all, all ears. <laughs> At this point, my only solution is to assume they're in the same class that I'm instantiating the function from. So the class that I'm instantiating the function from would be, to give you, I see a perplexed look there, so... Uh, so here's a class that has a bunch of setters, a bunch of getters, and the user defined type So there's the user defined type for Postgres, which basically mirrors what's in, in the so that you know it has a, a, a a is Boolean, B is a small integer, C is an integer. And then if you look in here, the type is exactly the same, <coughs> just mirrored, right? But there's no way to pass that, pass the package information in the function call, because all I get is the name of the, f I get the name of the uh, argument and I get the type name, but there's no package name. Postgres. On the Java side, maybe you would register what the name to. Yep. Yep, so that's one obvious one, right? Or, or put, it in the, put it in the Postgres, put the configuration in, in a Postgres table um, that did the, ma did the mapping. You're still looking perplexed. Are you good? <coughs> How much time have I got? And then the other one is auto boxing. How to do auto boxing so that I don't have to create a, like, I can have functions that are base types and functions that 
of wrapper types. I haven't played much with Postgres user-defined types. Can you mark types as not null in a, in the structure of a user-defined type, or are they always nullable on the Postgres side? They're always nullable. Oh, yeah, maybe it doesn't matter then. Right. Uh, I, think, I think you'd run into trouble if you started with the support equivalents and running this uh, effectively the same problem when you're going back and forth between the Scala and Java's uh, primitives, because Scala's Okay. Okay, that solves that problem. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm. That's basically what it is. So. One question about the synchronous thing, because it sounds really intriguing, like using these in um, triggers. Yep. Uh, say you do an update that affects a million rows. Yep. Are these calls the, the RPC calls? One at a time in order, or do they get pipelined? No, one at a time in order. Okay. So the question was, if you had a million row update on a trigger function, how to deal with the fact that it's going to, to call each one one at a time. And yeah, Postgres doesn't deal with that for you. So we have to. So the trigger has to finish before it goes to the next row? Yep. Okay. Well, it's actually, it's back to the uh, transaction stuff, it ha that has to happen that way. Otherwise, so if, it, if one of them failed in the middle, it, it would roll back the entire transaction. Right. But it could be, like, for just from transaction semantics point of view, they, they just all have to finish before the commit finishes, right? Like, you could be working your way through a table. You could have 100 rows of the update still in progress. You can't finish committing until they've all weighed in on whether they worked or not. Right. So if one of them failed, though, the whole commit would roll right. back. But it wouldn't be that harmful if, say, say, like the 37th one failed and you had already sent out 100 more trigger requests before you found out that the 37th one failed. Then you say, okay, well, we're now we're roll back only and we can stop. Um, Postgres can do that. Postgres doesn't do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, some other databases do do that, um, and that's been a discussion that I've seen before. Not Post exactly asynchronous. It would be more like just pipelining. Yeah. Function calls, right? Yep. So yeah, obviously, updating large amounts of rows would be very expensive. Yes. So is this definitively better than the scale Java stuff? Like, is this? No. I have no idea. <laughs> In my opinion, yes, but I'm not, I'm not about to uh, uh, definitively say yes, it's better. I mean, PL, PL Java arguably. Uh, does a lot of other things. It, it for one, it uh, implements a SQL data um, spec, and it, you can actually call back. It has its own JDBC driver inside it. You can call back into the into um, Postgres using JDBC from inside uh, PL Java. It it loads uh, jars from the from the from Postgres. I mean, it's a lot more feature fully fully featured. It just I happen to personally believe that most of that is useless. <laughs> but that's only my opinion. Before dangerous. <laughs> useless, da useless, <laughs> dangerous, <laughs> call it whatever you want. Right. It doesn't. It doesn't know anything about the query. The Query planner doesn't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah. it, it has no knowledge about that whatsoever. Um, so. Do you still mark these functions as like being like deterministic or whatever? I can't remember what you said before, but like when you say who wants to, every time you call, you can say who would want to return to the next Yep. Yep. You can do that. If it actually does that. Yeah, well. <laughs> 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 uh, mark it here for the <laughs> <laughs> See what yeah, It'll be a fun bug. <laughs> The, ja the Java program is uh, very, very small. It, it, it just it's can be whatever you want. It's ridiculously small. What's the turning point? What's the turning point? Yeah, that, that's sort of the, the question. 
I haven't even got that far yet. All it does is decode, decode it, uh, call it, and encode it back. Whether or not it, those are all good questions that I, I'm waiting for somebody to okay. come up with an answer for. Yep. <laughs> so what's the, the GitHub project? Do you want to show that so people can sure. connect? Dave Kramer slash PLJVM. All right. Cool. And actually, the, my logical decode one is there too, which is arguably more useful at the moment. Anybody that anybody that's using Postgres and isn't using logical decoding in Java needs to look at it. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.